This podcast is in association with the Blast Wing Shooting Kennels, the Russia to Flush Hunt Club, and is sponsored by American Natural Premium Dog Food, B Mountain Knife Works, and the National Bird Dog Circuit. We're excited to be back as episode one man. Are we? Do we thank you guys for all the support we're getting already in from the first episode and everybody that's going on? And I'm excited to come back on again and be with Alec again and kind of continue what we did where we're talking about the creating of Wingmasters and everything that we went through in the part one of getting you guys to know where we're going with this. And I think it's important that we continue this on with because. Everything is about the docks. So this is all about a story of building the docks. And we kind of ended with Winnie and stuff on, uh, you know, on the last episode. But on this episode, it's going to be nice to talk a little bit more with Winnie and a little bit about genetics and more about the dogs and everything that's come over the years of getting dogs to the points of what I have right now, as well as what the dogs that you've done with. But um, to see Winnie in her prime was a treat to many people all right and a lot of my friendships and everything that happened was because of winnie um one of my apprentices that was worked with me a lot was named craig anderson and he now runs his own business and and his whole dream of growing up i mean he trained with me when he was 19 years old and he was going to college and he was throwing birds and shooting flyers for me and he learned how to tournament hunt me. In fact, I mean, right now he's a number two dog in the country on the flushing side with his dog, Penny, which just happens to be Winnie's granddaughter. And he saw his whole goal was to own a Winnie puppy. So it's kind of a cool story because Brooke is now then. Yeah, I don't Were they married yet? Maybe they're married or maybe she was his fiance, whatever. But she wanted to surprise Craig with the best Christmas gift of all. And it's funny when Craig tells the story because when Craig tells the story is... He's at home. She comes up here and she calls me. Brooke calls me and says, hey, Mike, I want to surprise Craig with a Winnie puppy. He's been dreaming about it and it's time in life that we can do this together. I said, okay, there was two females in the litter. And I said, all right, the, the pick is yours. She says, well, pick it up because you know which one Craig's going to want. I said, you got it. So she comes and gets a puppy and the story that Craig tells is that he's laying there. She goes, I got a big, she can't wait to tell him. She cannot wait to give him this Christmas gift. And... He's laying there, he's relaxed, he said in the morning. He's just kind of like, all right, we got to start this Christmas stuff. And she comes in and puts this yellow lab on his puppy named Stella. And wait, well, later names her Stella. And Craig just sat there and said, he said he panicked. He said his heart sank. He said, if she just went out and got me a puppy from somewhere off the street, I'm going to flip. Because <laughs> <laughs> cause she knows that I want a Winnie puppy. And then she says, what do you think? And he said, he tells the story and he'll tell us better too. We'll have, we'll have him on sometime and he'll tell the story. But he said he sat there and he goes, um, where's this puppy from? <laughs> 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 and she says, she says, uh, Craig, it's, it's a Winnie puppy. Are you talking about this as Winnie for real? Like Mike Vaughn's Winnie? Yeah, this is Winnie. Like I arranged like, He's like, oh my God, I'm so relieved. And he said he sat there in awe because that was, Winnie was, when we were training, and the reason why he sat there in awe with the puppy to kind of finish the story, he said he sat there in awe like, oh man, my life has transpired to where I finally get to start training my first Winnie puppy. Well, then his Winnie puppy was the start of his own breeding program off of my genetics. And Craig's always been a huge backer and I'm so proud of him now of what he's done in the BDC. He's got his own BDC story and he's got a dog now with Penny that, now happens to be third generation Winnie and uh, actually goes from, uh, and actually might be fourth generation if I think about it now because it, it goes from, Winnie, from being. Winnie, King, Chopper, Penny. Yeah, yeah, Winger, King, Chopper, Penny. So um, 
and he's tearing it up, number two dog in the country right now. So that's a funny story. So there's lots of winning stories, and I think it's important to understand about genetics. And I want to start this off by the fact that we, I, I started with talking about my first dog in the last episode about Toddy. And Toddy was an important part because like anybody, he was, it's your first dog. You, you just learn a lot about him. You know, the hip dysplasia I told you guys about, I told you guys about, you know, um, well, I didn't even say that he had bad eyes. He had droopy eyes. He, you know, there was just a lot of things that happened. He's my first one. And he's important. But there's a piece of a puzzle here that's in for us doing this again to talk about the journey of Wingmasters right now that what people don't know is at that time when I owned Toddy, before I got Bella and before I got Winnie and got another lab, I got a pointer. And I read this book that is the epitome of genetics to me for what I idolized. And the book was called Snakefoot, The Making of a Champion by Robert Welly. And he formed an L. Hugh English pointer, 40 years of breeding. His last name spelled backwards was L. Hugh, and that's how he named his kennel. He wrote a bunch of books, but one of them was called Snakefoot, Making of a Champion. And the whole book was about his years of breeding, and he got to the what he thought was the most perfect pointer in his breeding program, which was Snakefoot. Snakefoot went on to be a champion, and he said he had come to the epitome of his genetics at Snakefoot. And now if you go to any of the Alhu nowadays, I mean, Alhu has now kind of been watered out. Now there's lots of, uh, I don't know what you'd say now, kind of politics in Alhu, but because um, he passed it on to um, uh, Hayes. I can't remember what his name was. And then Hayes died of cancer. And then actually his, his wife now, has said no more LHU name. So now the genetics that are out there are just the LHU genetics. There is no more actual LHU kennel anymore. His wife cut it off and said we are no longer allowing anybody to use the LHU name. And so that's when I, but I idolized that book. And I did it because it taught about characteristics. It taught about um, gen uh, athleticism. It talked about personalities. It talked about the it factors. It talked about so many things that were important in, in what it is to have a dog. And now that's what you're seeing now with chaos coming from there. Rock was, so, so a crazy thing about Rock then, I want to talk about Rock. I call him Volta L. Hugh Rockstar. I was so pumped to have an L. Hugh Pointer. I mean, I dreamed about it. And here's the thing. I wanted a female because I wanted a female so that I could breed it eventually and have my own puppies and have a foundation female. I think it's important to understand that in a breeding program, there's a foundation female is so important. Everybody wants to talk about the stud dogs, and we'll talk about my studs. But a foundation female is so important. Anybody who's a breeder in this country that listens to this podcast or anybody that's a breeder understands that a brood matron, which is what they call it, all right, is a female that is very dominant in what she does, very athletic, can perform, and throws puppies as good or better than she was. All right. And then obviously paired with the right sire. But everybody wants to give credit to the sire because the sire is more popular because he, uh, you're seeing a lot more pups out of the sire. The female can only have so many puppies in her lifetime. The sire can have as many as you allow him to breed and as many as the litter will have, which I'll explain about a little bit. So a foundation female is so important of what it was. So I wanted a female with rock. I'm all excited. I'm on the list for like six months. He calls me, um, J.D. Irvine in Rockport, Missouri. He says, uh, Nitro Kennels, he says to me, we got your pup. I said, all right, how many? And I wanted an orange and white. I love orange and whites. I love the orange and white English pointer. And I'll tell you why I love the English white, uh, the orange and white English pointers is because they look more like beagles. And because of that, of going back to what we talked about in the first episode with Yukon, when I looked at an English pointer, it was like the bird dog version of a beagle. So I think that's also kind of like in the back in my subconscious the way it was. So he calls me, he says, we got three puppies. I said, okay, how many females? He says, none. I was like, man, you got to be kidding me. I wanted to start my own foundation female off of this. And uh, so I said to him, he says, so all you can do is, well, I waited like a year. I've been waiting like six months to a year on this list to get one out of this specific breeding that was orange and white. I could have had a black and white. I could have had a... I could have had anything, any other color, but I liked the orange and white and I was waiting for an orange and white. And 
So I take the male and I name him Voltel here Rockstar. I take him Rockstar and I have somebody train him at the time to study him up. And then I'm going to force fetch him myself. As I'm starting to learn through Toddy, he's got to get force fetched. But I'm learning how to force fetch. So before I'm even going on to Bella and before I'm even going on Tally and on to Winnie, I got this pointer in between which starts my um, curiosity and starts my kind of passion for the English pointers. And so I got Rock and I take in Rock and I'm like, all right, I'm going to force such him, but I'm going to have somebody else study him because I don't know yet about winging shot and about doing all that yet. And uh, and I'm learning about all the different standards in which you put on the pointing breeds now instead of the instead of the flushing and the waterfall breeds. So Rock starts teaching me, well, the same exact story as Toddy happens. He's a year old. One day he gets off the couch. We hear him whine. I say, boy, what's he? I took him out running that day or training. Why is he whining coming off the couch? All right, must be something wrong with him. He must be hurt. Take him to the vet. The vet says, we'll do some x-rays. X-rays his hips. Now, Rock's got grade three hip and hip dysplasia. The same as Toddy, and he's a year old. So my first two dogs now, mind you, to get the creating of Wingmasters down the line here, my two first dogs, Toddy, which you heard in the last episode, and Rock, now that you're hearing in episode two now, is that we're both hip dysplasia and both did not have the health clearances. So getting devastated twice was super hard on me for two dogs. So I was like, all right, I am now really understanding genetics on that. I got to get around the excellent hips. See, in English pointers, they don't check hips and elbows. They just breed them. They don't do like we do in the lab world, but, but I do. Like my pointers nowadays will all have their hips and elbows checked. I, I believe in that and eyes. I believe in that you got to do it even if the breed doesn't do it, you know. The, the other uh, popular, I mean, this happened in German Shepherds too. German Shepherds and, and Labs are like, we're like the number one dogs in the country. So you had to check their hips, you know, and elbows and eyes. So, but, so Rock starts my, my thing. Well, now what I got to do, I mean, I end up giving Rock to a, to a hunter and telling him I hope Rock goes and lives a good life, but I can't. You, if you decide to become a breeder, like I knew I wanted to be a breeder. I knew I wanted performance dogs. I knew that I wanted to, to create something. I was so, I was becoming such a geek in genetics on pedigrees, just like when I had the beagles and in labs, I was studying every pedigree and every single thing I could. And I knew then that I wanted to be it. So then you got to make hard decisions. I can't keep a dog that's genetically, uh, that's got genetic issues. You know, just think about this. Just think if I would have. Just think about it. I tried to hide that and where I'm at nowadays 15 years later or more than that now. Just think about how that would have crept up on me and how, how genetics would have. You can breed two excellent to excellent hip dogs in a lab world and still get a hip dysplasia. There's no guarantee. Still, There's no guarantee to it, you know. So, and now, and yet you would put it in the, the breeding program knowing it's defective like nowadays, people are, I mean, I find it crazy. Nowadays in the world, I'd be, I'd be cautious. People ain't testing elbows now. All of a sudden, we're on this frenzy in the lab world that we're not going to test elbows now. Well, it's coming because they say, well, they're jumping out of the truck too much. They're, they're running too hard when they're young, when they're, when they're conditioning. Okay, well, every dog that's past their, their elbows or their hips is coming out the same way. So all of a sudden, somebody had a, and a bad elbow and goes, well, that dog's got good hips, good bad elbow. Uh, yeah, our kennel don't believe in testing elbows anymore. You know, I've had to give, I've had some heartaches on elbows and we can get down that on, on different dogs on elbows and everything like that. So when we're talking genetics and we're, and we're getting into a breeding program of this, and we're talking about the background of my kennel and breeding and like what I believed in, man, I had to have tough skin. I had heartbreaks. I've had more, I got more heartbreaks than just these stories, but Rock and Toddy both started off like, all right, now if I'm going to do this in the future, if I'm going to stick money into them and I'm going to believe them and eventually I want to breed them, well, I got to I gotta make sure that I protect you and you and anybody out there that wants to buy a puppy for me. And I need to pay respect and homage to my breed that if I'm going to be a responsible breeder, I'm breeding for the betterment of the breed. Well, if I know there's something wrong with the dog and I'm breeding at my genetic pool, all right, I'm not bettering the breed. I'm just, I'm just trying to fill my... I'm just trying to fill my pockets and make money off the dogs. So I always get that too. Is people, oh, you make you make money off the dogs. You shouldn't be able to make money do- money off the dogs. Like you kidding me? 
You know how much, how many miles I put on? How many hunt tests I go to? You know how much stuff I travel everywhere I go? I mean, think about where we've been. Yeah. You know, what we've done. I mean, just a little time that you've known me. I got 15 years in this thing, right? And we're not supposed to. So that's kind of the, kind of the start of everything is there was a pointer passion. So then, you know, I let go or I go, okay, now he's hit the stage. I got rid of him. Okay, now I'm back to Toddy. And now we go back to episode one where I got Bella and I'm running her through your program. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to, I got a replacement dog for, for Rock. I gave it to a friend of mine um, named Travis Ruther. She went on to be another BDC amateur national champion. Her name was, uh, well, when I picked her up, her name was China. I'm like, yeah, we're going to change that name. Who the frick names and name talk China? <laughs> <laughs> Needs to talk China. So we're like, all right. Well, we ended up naming her Fancy is what we did. And anyway, he took her, got her trained. And she ended up being an amateur BDC national champion probably in 12 or 13 is when she was a BDC national champion. But, you know, so we changed we changed her, her name. But then I just go, all right, forget it. I'm done with the pointers. I need to focus on the labs. And then that's where Bella comes in and it comes to Winnie. But as we said in the last episode, it was about Winnie and... I wanted to stop there and talk about her. You know, like when you, like how about when I told you you need a runner? Oh, that was the best. That was when I was learning. And when you were learning, when I told you, hey, I'm, well, I'm I going started, to, yeah. I started off with my golden retriever, Chester, and then I ran Cowboy the first one, those two, and then I ran Journey, and then the third, I'm like, I want to I wanna run Winnie because she wasn't getting run at all except for at the Super Majors. Right. And just going to rip one. I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the dog I want to keep running. We only had three. three. They take the top three combined scores yeah, out of your five events for the Packerland. And I had three opportunities. So I couldn't – you you had three oppor- – I had three opportunities left since I didn't run her in the first two. And that's right. when I took second for dog of the year. So I couldn't screw up with her. I couldn't miss a shot. I had to make sure I was consistent. I had to find all my birds. I had to put up good times each time. She ended up taking second. She only had three chances. It was one dog, three chances – for right. the top three combined scores. So you, you couldn't have one bad score. But like when he's talking about genetics, I think it's really important because there's not something. It made me really upset one day when he told me this. When I was training my golden retriever, Chester, he came from a, not a backyard breeder. It was just a nice breeder that bred golden retrievers twice a year. Great puppies, family dogs. And not upset in a bad way. He made me realize that when we were out quartering, he told me when we were quartering him, you can have a dog that has a lower genetic ability and he's just a normal dog and you can only get him to this height. Where I have a dog that has a genetic ability that starts up here and his max level is up here. That dog is probably never going to be a champion with his genetic ability because it, it limits out at a point. You can have a great dog that doesn't have genetics behind him. He was a great dog, but he didn't have that little extra oomph that I was looking for. And when you told me that, I thought, I'm like... Oh, I'm gonna prove him wrong. I'm gonna I'm gonna win with this dog. Well, it turns out I found out in my first term. Like, say I I wing a bird and it would fly off 150 yards. Well, he'd give up on me. If it wasn't dropping dead, he wouldn't go get it. So then I'm like, and I thought back to that day. I'm like, he knew exactly what he was talking about, and that's what led me to my dog Chaos, who will run down with birds hundreds of yards. He'll die before he quits. Yeah. And like when you told me that, like it hurt at first, but some people need to hear that. If you want to compete with the best dogs in the country. You have to get the best dogs in the country from the genetics. You have to look at the genetics. You're not going to, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. You can get enough. we've talked about this. You can get a phenomenal dog just from a nobody pedigree. Right. That's totally possible, but you want the highest chance of that. That's why you're going to go to the best pedigrees. That's why I want the best puppy. Right. And you're, you're bringing up a huge point there. Um, and I was just in a conversation about this today with actually with you guys earlier, it's you and Tony Peterson earlier. It's like, you know, because Tony Peterson has Pyro, who's the number one dog in the country right now for BDC for Upland. But, you know, when you get just exactly what you're saying, Max, and all, all right, when you just go buy a dog, all right, you're stuck with whatever you get, right? And the whole idea of genetics, the whole idea of, like I was telling you about our neighbors, right? This is a this is a great example. Me and you were driving the truck the other day, and I said, "You see that cow on Highway 52, right here by Wassa, Wisconsin? We got what's called Ninnaman Farms, and outside of Wassa, Wisconsin, by us in our neighborhood. And that cow, there's a statue of the cow, 
at the front of the yard. And he, I said, you know what that represents? No, I just thought it was a cow statue for the farm, he said. I said, no, that cow made them a million dollars in milk and started their whole farm. All right, now, if you're talking about cows or livestock, right, they're judging that dairy cow based on how she produces milk year after year and then how her offspring produces milk. And in generations after generations, they realized that they built their whole farm more and more off of her so that they would have a high producing milk farm, right? So a higher probability coming out of those genetics. Now, could they go buy a cow and have a decent uh, milk ratio? Yeah, no problem. But they want right? to make the but best. But you want to keep making the best. And then if you're breeding properly, you should be creating better than what you had before or the same as what you had before. So if you have a really good dog, you go, all right, I, I want another one of these. Well, you should be able to create another one. And like right now, the whole kennel's full. Yeah. It's like when we're out training right now because of the genetics I've built and what we've done, the kennel's full. And we go, well, pick one. They all have all of good. And don't get me wrong. There's dogs out there that I'll say, okay, this is, if I'm training your dog, and here's a prime example. If I'm training your dog, whether you buy it from me or from somebody else, all right, I'm going to say to you, I'm not going to. Other trainers get us, give of my industry a bad rap, you know, and you've been tra- working with me now and been an apprentice trainer here now to understand this. They give me a bad rap because what they do is they have a dog that's, they know they can't do it, but they soak the owner for money for months on end. And then at the end, they blame it on that dog and they say, you know what? The dog's just not that good, you know, and I'm sorry, but I, there was nothing to do. But he took all the owner where they could have just told him after one month, you know, you know what? This dog ain't going to cut it. I can try but just letting you know, it's going to cost you a lot of money for me to try when I'd probably tell you to go buy an R. So like here, when I, I'll tell somebody right away, I ain't afraid to tell them, hey, listen, I can get this dog to a decent level, but for what you're looking for, I might not be able to with this genetic makeup. You and know? I think going off that, how many times have I came in here after training some dogs and said how much I appreciate your genetics? Mm-hmm. I can tell the difference. Usually if you bring me two different dogs and if I'm not looking at the looks because your dogs have very distinctive looks, beautiful, nice heads. But if I'm not looking at that and I go out and train, how many times have I said, I appreciate your genetics? Yeah. I love having Journey, Cowboy, all your females in there. It just makes training enjoyable. Like yeah. I, two days ago, I think I said when we were throwing clip wings for some puppies, I said we had our puppies like Karma and then Morgan. They were nailing pigeons on the first, second day at three months old just to show them a bird. And then you got four months old that will chase it but they don't know what to do with it exactly. It's that instinctive drive that comes from the genetics, that comes from that one generation, two generation, all in your pedigree. Right. Yeah, the, a puppy is a reflection of what's behind them. Exactly. Just like we're a reflection of our parents. Now, if you have a bad past in your parents, like you can change yourself who you want to be. We talk about self-improvement all the time in my tidbits and everything. And going off that, do you want to explain Journey's uh, AKC name? That talks about what you just said and your reference point of, going through the generations. Yeah. I think that fits perfectly right here. Yeah, that's a good story. You're bringing me back to a, to a darker spot. But yeah, that's good. That When I was going through my divorce, I had a guy come to me, and this was how Journey's kennel name came out. And I called him the Blast Red Path. And I was like, I said, I lost who I was. I said, I can't get back to who I am. I, my motivation's low, like... My drive's low. I feel like my direction's going. I feel like the, uh, I'm kind of at rock bottom here. I just can't think right at, off of my divorce. Because as you're building life and you're building life with somebody, you're getting your house, you're making your finances, you're falling in love, you're moving forward in life, right? You have I have a really good house at the time. Okay, now I got none of that. Now you're divorced. Now you're starting over. And, I, and I'm like, I'm losing myself. And one of my martial arts friends said to me, well, he says, man, you need to go back and study your red path. And I said, red path? What does that mean? He's like, well, your great grandpa, you know, my great grandpa was named great grandpa Pete Gunderson. And, and he was an ideas man, but he had zero work ethic. <laughs> the guy was like a hobo, right? So I mean, he'd ride around, he's driving around with pennies in his pocket all the time. Uh, my great, my grandpa on my Thompson side, on my, on my Thompson side was uh, on my mom's side, my grandpa Thompson, Don Thompson. He's a hard worker. That guy is still working. He's 87 years old. There's not a day he doesn't work right now. You know, my grandpa on my, on my um, dad's side, my grandpa Vaughn, all right, well, he has a person that where he laughed, and I heard back in the day he threw people out of the bar. So it's probably some of our martial arts fighting backgrounds and 
you know, probably some of my bar stories probably comes from that. <laughs> try not to throw people out of the bar anymore, you know. But I try not to get to that level anymore. Who knows, though, what happens when you got something in you. But so I went back and, like, it was interesting. And my my mom's a real vibrant. Um, Tina Vaughn, my mom, she's a real vibrant personality. So I get that, my, my personality from her. My dad's real, like, has this knack for knowing what's right and to do things and really thinks through and really is – is calculating up stand stuff. So I get some of that. So when I went through that, that helped me so much. Well, at the time, Journey was a puppy, and I was looking for his registered name, and that was what how it came. And when you told me about the Red Path, I thought that was the coolest. It's through why you got the nose you got. You got it from your great grandpa. Well, yep. that's what we're, Stony. We always talk. Well, we've mentioned right. Stony. Yep. But where do you think they got that nose from? Well, if you go through the Red Path, their pedigree, we think it came from Stony. Right. So then, if you go through the Red Path of your dog's pedigree then I can probably tell you what's traits. So like a lot of times people come here, bring their dog for training and they'll say, hey, uh, I'll say, can you give me the pedigree? And if they give me the pedigree, I'll look at it. And I know every pedigree in the country of what level they're at, right? So if you give me the pedigree, I'll be like, the pedigree will usually tell me the story of what I'm dealing with, right? Okay, if I'm going to be dealing with, uh, let's just say I got a half American, or let's just say I got a full English lab. Well, I know they're going to they're gonna be slower starters and a little more lazier and you got to push them. Okay, let's say I'm dealing with a real high hybrid field trial lab. Okay, I know that they're going to be obnoxious and they're going to be bouncing off the walls and I'm going to have to back them down a little bit and be like, okay, slow down, all right? Okay, if I'm, if I'm dealing with a British or a British-American cross, okay, I know I'm dealing with a dog that's hot and cold. They're up and down, right? And then every dog, every stud dog and every pairing makes different things for you to know. Like, I can tell you, I can point a journey puppy from a mile away. Oh yeah. You know. Yep. I can um, point a puppy, but uh, a uh, cowboy puppy from a mile away. Um, so you're you were talking about dog's characteristics because it's so important for you to understand your dog, and it's so important. So if you're sitting here going, "Oh, my dog's the best, and he don't have no pedigree," and I don't care what Mike Vaughn says on that Wingmasters podcast because you know I got a really good dog here that does everything I want. Yeah, yeah, correct. Yeah, we're not saying We're not that. saying that there's anything wrong. If you're, I, t- I did a tidbit two, three years ago that says, uh, one of my Friday tidbits was, a champion is whatever makes the dog good in your eyes. All right, now, let's l- stop there and say, all right, I want to start competing. I want to start hunt testing. I want to start, I want to go to AKC hunt test or HRC hunt test. I want to start going to Upland bird dog tournaments. Okay, these people don't have no mercy on you. All right. You go to a hunt test and you got a dog that's a pig on learning blinds and he's, his trainability is low. Okay. And then he all of a sudden decides to be a pig on you at, at the hunt test and blow you off on a blind. Okay, you're not passing the hunt test. The judge just says, uh, go back and train. Good luck next time. All right. You want to go play against the top 10 or 20 players in the country at the National Bird Dog Circuit and have a dog that that's, uh, you know plods around and doesn't run lines and doesn't want to win? Okay, good luck. There's t- I mean, there's more than 20, but I mean... There ain't a single person in the dang BDC right now that doesn't want to just I mean, just take you out. I mean, everywhere you go. We said that there's a defining moment when you figure out when you want the when you want something better or if you're okay with it. Right. So I think what people like, the, and this is a great point to bring up right now. I think people bring this to me all, all the time. People call me up, hey, Mike, I want a puppy. Yep. Uh, I got one for you. I, I don't need one of those good champions. And I'll be like, <laughs> okay. These champions are laying on my floor or are sleeping in bed with me. So what you're telling me is, is give me the worst dog you got because a, a champion is too crazy for me. It's like, no, 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 no. What we've, what I've bred and what genetics brings you is like in my, in my place, these dogs that are, that are champions are laying on the floor at night. They got an on and off switch. You got to create in your breeding program off on and off switch. I'm very proud of that. All my genetics are. You know, when you when you buy a puppy from me, the dog is going to be able to shut it off in the house and be able to um, turn it on in the field. And then if you want that upper level of winning some type of performance level, oh, you're dang right, they're going to be right for that too. You know, and, and, and with that being in mind, like the English pointer, you know, I talk about Mike for one second. And I, I probably, I won't, since we're, we're jumping around a little bit, but we're in genetics, so these stories are important. You know, Mike's story is an interesting story. I guess we just go into that story right now then. Well, one thing that I wanted to say. Yeah, was, go ahead. Was say just it. off, Before off we went reading, we talked about uh, a day or two ago. You can cross, you can breed to top level a stud in a dam 
and those puppies might not turn out. You were talking, you, you touched on um, how uh, they pair together. Right. You can pair two FCAFC champions, and those puppies couldn't do worth a damn. Right. Like, it just happens like that. You could breed a really, really nice stud to not so nice. Damn, you could get the best puppies. It's always that chance. That's why you want to find, what is it, Nicks? You call Nicks. it Nicks in yeah, the breeding? Yeah. A nick means a mating that every time you make it produces great puppies. Like Tim Samuelson and I, he's got his uh, national champion, Raven. And then we bred her to, you know, a world champion, Journey. And then obviously they're both master hunters. I train them both. And we bred it. And every, I think that pairing's been made four times. And every time we made that pairing, there's been phenomenal puppies. I mean, I've had Boone. That was a master hunter before his two. I've had Storm, which right now is Storm is Tim's the the one out of the last breeding, and that little one, uh, you know, she just won the Puppy National Champion, and she just won two Super Majors already, and she just turned two. It's Tim's up and coming female. Um, that pairing made a Nick, so it's called a Nick. Yeah, is when you make a pairing that every time you make the pairing, the puppies are phenomenal. I just thought it was important to touch on that. You can think it has a great pedigree from the, looking at the stun. Yeah. Damn, but you never know until you see the puppies. Yeah, so as being a trainer and a breeder, like I contradict myself sometimes. So I can see a pedigree and go. And I didn't mean to make it like that. I was just saying. I no, yeah. Talking, I remember talking about this where yeah. you can look at it, but you could be completely wrong. Too. Oh, 100%. Like if yeah. you're looking, I really want to puppy out of that. Those That's done and damn. And you're like, God dang. Yeah. This is not what I was expecting. It's not what you're expecting. It didn't, it didn't pair up right. Yeah. Yes. And you can do that. You can look at. Uh, pedigree that on, and it depends on what your 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 pedigree to you. It depends on what an impressive pedigree is to you. Yep. Like I'll look at two sides of the fence for me. Well, actually, three sides of the fence for me. All right. I'll look at the field trial, which is you know the number one intelligence for running 400 yard marks and blinds and national champions. And I like that drive and I like that ability of intelligence because that's extreme intelligence to get to that level of becoming a field champion. And all right. Then I'll look at, I'll look at nice upland pedigrees. All right, and the upland pedigrees are like what I see the dogs that did good in tournaments. All right, and then I'll look at pointing labs. Like since I got cowboy now, I'll look at pointing lab pedigrees and what the good pointing lab pedigrees are. All right, and so then I'll look at what they're doing. Okay, so I can have a dog that's out of two field champions that should be a good hunt test dog, so out of their mind they can't focus. They're too high. Right, and then I can have just a nice. Master hunter to master hunter or whatever you want to call, whatever standard you want to do, just a nice hunt test pedigree or a nice tournament hunt pedigree. And that dog be level-headed to do what exactly what I want. So when you find the, like for me, when I found the level of what I wanted in my kennel, what I wanted to produce, then you start reproducing it. Then you start staying within the confines of what you believe in, right? Exactly. So, you know, Rock was the, the start of this podcast because he leads to... Um, what people have been hearing about with Mike. One of my favorite stories. Yeah. <laughs> and I, and you might, I said this in some tidbits, but now we're, we're putting it out on the, on the podcast now about Mike. Now, if, if for you people that don't know, uh, Mike is my English pointer and his name is Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and you, and you didn't name No, him everybody. Mike. They said, boy, I want an egomaniac. He names his dog <laughs> after him. <laughs> this guy's got quite the ego. Uh, no, this guy had na- had bought Mike from Texas. He brought him for me to become tra- to train. I was training a few pointers on the side. I've always trained a few pointers on the side. I just never advertised for training for pointers. Now, the kennel's starting to get full of pointers because of Mike. And yeah. now you see a lot of pointers here too. But um, And so he has a Mike. I trained Mike. Okay, sent him off. Well, the guy couldn't keep Mike. He had things going on in life. And he gives them back to me. Now, this is where it gets good. I tell the tournament hunters, listen. Mike is is a winner. You guys want to buy him, and I was, and now I look back at some for just a stupid cheap price too, but nobody knew that he was proven yet. And Mike and I go through two or three tournament hunters, and I'm telling him you got to get him. Well, they didn't believe me because well, you're a flushing guy. You got labs. You don't know anything about pointers. I'm like, well, actually, I do. I had rock back in the day, and I've trained pointers all the way through my years. I just never advertised that I trained pointers. So I only took a few on the side because I'm so busy with labs. And uh, so. After the third person got off the phone, they said, no, no. And I wasn't so upset about them not taking Mike. That's not what I was upset about. I was upset about people writing me off that I didn't know what a good pointer was in BDC. And when you write me off, 
that's about the worst thing you could do. You probably. took that personally. Uh, it, <laughs> <laughs> Love just, MJ. Yeah, just like MJ from the I last took dance. That personally. Michael Jer- Jordan. I took that personally. Yeah. Oh yeah. Now we're. <laughs> One of our favorite things. One of our favorite things. So, yep. yeah, I was Michael Jordan. I'm like, I took that personally. Oh, yeah. And it was like, it was perfect because at the time, BDC was kind of, a, or tournament hunting was in this thing. Well, you can play in numbers. So, if I can enter four dogs, well, I got four dogs against you and I can play numbers. And it's like, no, you can do it with one dog. I had a dog named Winnie. It only takes one. It only takes one. And you got to have a good one that shows up for you every time. And that was my girl, Winnie, which we'll talk more about. But we're on the mic subject right now. So, so yeah, I took I took that personally. So then I I told him uh, so I walked out of the kennel. I was mad, and I was walking to go back to work some dogs by my pond. And I look at my kennel, and Mike's just sitting there, all proud, looking at me. And in the sun, in the sun, the sun's coming out of the south, and the kennel is facing the south, and he's just looking at me. And he's got a he's a stud looking son of a gun, and oh, yeah. and uh, he's a dang good looking English pointer and a liver and white. And uh, so I I look at him and I said. You know what, Mike? We got a lot to prove, and I believe in you, and here we go. And I walked right back into the, to the clubhouse, the front office of our building here, and I called the guy and said, I'll buy him. I said, where do I mail the check? And now there's a whole story coming about Mike, and so we're bouncing around a little bit. But I think it's important to understand that um, my passion for pointers goes all the way back from, like, 2007. And you're going to see this in the film and online that we're going to have yeah. a pointing program. yeah. And that's where, yeah, exactly. I'm glad you just mentioned that because we're we're not leaving the pointer pointer people out. We're not it's leaving. It's not the just flushing, right? I it's think not that's just what, waterfowl. It's not just up one. It's everything that you want in a hunting dog, and you get to select what you want. That's if the, you if you don't want waterfowl, you don't have to buy the waterfowl package. You can buy the up one package, but you get the opportunity to have an, the ultimate hunting dog. Right. Literally. Literally, I mean, that's... <laughs> it's so exciting to talk you're about. You're just saying that right now. Yeah, 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 oh, hair up on me Because we're working our butts off. I'm making this happen. And you're just putting... You're making a hair stand up on, on the back of my neck and my arms right now because I'm so excited about this journey that we're taking you guys on. We just... We, there's so many people that I've talked to, even my buddies that want to train their own dog. Yeah. Asking how to force fetch. It's so hard to explain, like, over text. You can't explain over no. text how to force fetch. And I just no. want to be like, go to Wingmasters. Yeah. You, Wingmasters USA. Oh, I can't now. wait until And that's going to be a... Here, copy, send... I can't wait until the day until we oh. can say, hey, just go on and start going. And, and if you got any questions, let's rock. I can't yep. wait. I can't wait for the day of, of that. But Mike, so Mike comes along now and I start. Well, first, I got a third. Then somebody else, or I got a fourth. And he was only a year and a half. Somebody else got a fourth on the next one at random. So I couldn't run him. And then I went third and third. And then bingo, win, win. Right now. Mike is tied for the most super major wins ever in the BDC, and he's only four years old right now. In the record book. In the record book. In supposedly, the record book. Outside, two more, three supposedly more. outside the record books, there, I'm three, off, I'm four off of winning, but we're going to get that this year. Oh, yeah. We're pretty confident that you're going to tie that. We'll go over what the record books say, but we'll go over what everybody wants to say is the hearsay deal, too. But I, and so it was a perfect opportunity because now I had built my lab string up with, I have Winnie, you know. I got Journey. I built Cowboy. All right, and coming right behind Cowboy is you know Whisper, which was out of Winnie. She she was she's in there. She's a uh, Winnie's last breeding that I bred her to. I bred her to Cowboy, and I kept the. There was only one female pup, and I kept her. And her name's Whisper, and she's still here. She's getting bred this year. Um, her litter's already all full and everything already. And so, she's she's a freaking maniac. Yeah, she's a field. maniac too, and she's another uh, foundation. So I got Whisper, and then. And then now my two that I'm really excited about, which is Patriot and Reason. Reason's got puppies right now, and she's been tearing it up in the tournaments, and she's due for a win. And, you know, well, I mean, like you, you ran her. Yep, took fourth at the Players' Championship, first time ever running her in Top Gun. And she's dark, dark. Oh, yeah, she's beautiful. Now, going on this subject is I think we need to touch on Fox Reds. Yeah, hold on. Let's finish Mike. Oh, you're okay. Fair enough. Yeah, that's- yeah fair enough. I thought you were off of Mike. <laughs> no, I. I thought you were done with Mike. I know we're jumping off. Now, we're, now we're on the. <laughs> let's stay with Mike. You know, okay, deal. Hey, hang with us. Yeah, let's just stay with Mike. Now let's go on the Fox Trades. Yeah, but so to finish Mike out, I go and I place Mike, and I start winning with Mike, and I'm doing it with one dog. So I started telling people, all right, watch me now. A good player with the way to format and learning from me how to tournament hunt, you can go be successful with one dog. I started it with Winnie. And built up to my labs being full. Okay, now I'm doing it with Mike, right? And I go with Mike, and I show everybody one dog. I go over to the pointer side. I got one dog. I'm putting him in the finals and winning. Mike is only the second dog 
in BDC history to sweep the national doubleheader championships. Tim Samuelson and I won the doubles uh, in 22 with them, and we I won the singles. He swept it, doubleheader national champion at the BDC in 22 nationals. We He's the only one ever in second history. Last one to do it was in 2005 with Scott Cusso and this dog named Jade. And so Mike's only second one in history in, tw- in 25 years of the organization going on, right? That's the level of dog got on now. So now... As, I, as a side thing, as something I like to do personally now is I'm building my English pointer. Which would lead to Candace. Which now. leads to Candace. And Candace is my next girl. And you see her in the, well, in this new intro we got that we just yep. did. That was fun. Put us this new intro. This is kick ass now. So if you haven't seen it, if you're listening to this, you need to go watch the new intro. It's pretty badass. Facebook or YouTube. Yeah, Facebook or YouTube. And uh, Candace is on there. She's locking a point. She's the pointer puppy in there. That was there. the third, second day. That was yep. on the second day of you yeah, leading her into a bird. First time. Right. And Candace is and Candace is now becoming my foundation female we were just talking about earlier. So And how many how many how many foundation or how many females did you have to go through to get to Candace? Yeah, here we go again. So uh, Since the, we're on the pointer. Since we're, we're on the pointer, we'll just finish well off finish. where we're going. Yeah. Candace is is my fourth go around. There's four females that I've raised and trained in between this that I did not, would not make the cut here. Will they make the cut for somebody else? Yes. But for what I believe in, for intelligence and, and health genetic, uh, being genetically free and um, competitive spirit and being good house dogs and the whole overall package of what I believe is a breeder, she's these other there. ones didn't fit. And now Candace is like, she's a mini Mike and everybody thinks she's out of Mike because she's another liver and white. <laughs> But she ain't Mike. So the best part about this is she gets to get bred to Mike. And you never, I don't believe you ever touched on this, but one thing that you, uh, being a breeder, you you have to take into consideration, not only that you're selling people, their puppies, but as a trainer and a breeder, those genetics are going to come back to you. Oh man. Yes. So if you would have kept one of those pointers or a lab, a female lab or a male lab that you didn't like, whether pointer or flusher, you have to come back. They're going to come back most likely and get trained by you. And then you have to deal with that same thing. Oh Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of trainers in this country to envy me, because because they because they're hunt test trainers and they're um, a lot of them are hunt test and field trial trainers. They got a hodgepodge of genetics all around the country, and they they envy me because they're like, you know how awesome it'd be to wake up to train a dog that I believe in every day, the one the personalities I like every day, and like I even said that back in the day, I said I can't wait yeah. until one day that, and so guys that I talk to that are highest level in the in the country that, that I've traveled with on a hunt test trail and seen in the field trials. And I know they're like, Mike, you know how lucky you are. We have to try to, we have to try to do stuff. We'll have people and this happens, right? They look at only the paper and they'll, and if you're not living up to what they see on the paper as the trainer, then they blame it on you. Well, I'm going to switch trainers because it's your fault. That isn't. No, I'm telling if you're a good reputable trainer, you're telling the person, Listen, this dog just don't have it. I don't care what that piece of paper says, yep. right? So yeah, now when I go out, like you just said, and being an apprentice here, when you grab the genetics that we got now, it's it, so enjoyable. It's so enjoyable because you're you're getting out. You know what to expect, and then you know where your your problems are going to be along the way in the process in order to mold that dog. Yep. And it's like many times now when I'm training a dog, anybody's dog, or we'll just say within my genetics right now, but. I'll be training in a dog and I'll be like, yep, exactly the way her dad did at that age. Or exactly the way his dad did. Exactly the way Journey did at that time. Exactly what Cowboy did at the time. Exactly what Winnie did at the time. You know, Chopper. Exactly what, you know, so it's it's funny because the like some of the same, it's crazy how genetics are, how it almost becomes cloning. How the same problems will show up the same timeline in the training out of the same dog and I'll be like oh man I remember now I remember when Jerry chaos and Avery yeah chaos and Avery same thing that you know you telling me about that just like his mom just like I said he's just like his mom when we were starting to do power work and everything like that so yeah you know Winnie I mean you know we started this with Winnie and we said we do a whole podcast for her and Winnie's gonna just keep popping in right so to go from Winnie and to go into the Fox Red thing that you were mentioning earlier and you know, it, it pretty much, it's just going to be giving on this podcast that Winnie's talked about all the time. I mean, this girl right here was was everything. This was an awesome day, too. Another great story. But, um, And I'm pointing out a picture right now. If you're just listening on your truck, we got a picture on the table of Winnie with I and a pheasant. Um, and But she, when I started studying Winnie's genetics, 
And I talked about who I bought it from in the last podcast and stuff. I There was a dog named Stoney, and I mentioned Stoney more than anybody. Uh, White Oak, Stoney Berkey. He was a master hunter and qualified all age. He was a fox red male that Torx Labs owned. And I believe the nose of my genetics comes from him because he's in the he's Journey's grandsire and he's Winnie's grandsire. And I've seen other dogs out of him that I can pick him out anywhere. And... I believe that it starts back with him for the nose. So I believe the nose of my kennel comes from this dog named Stoney. And I've mentioned it on other podcasts I've been on. And I mentioned Stoney a lot because these are pre before I have my genetics. So I'm studying the pedigree, trying to figure out where my genetics is going. So when you're starting out, if you want, if you want to get to eventually you want to breed your dog, well, you want to know the history. Like right now, if you own one of my dogs and you bought a dog from one of, one of my pedigrees when it brings you go you know someday down the line i want to breed my dog and uh and raise a litter of puppies and keep a puppy out of it and train it myself all right which is something that you're on the trail with right with karma well you got to know what the history of that dog is before and then it really starts to click and make you prideful when you train something like that so i studied winnie's pedigree and it was talking about stoney well he was a fox red male and he was this proud real strong look and i think he would I think if I remember, he was like 75 pounds. And I look at him like, Fox Red? I didn't even know what a Fox Red was. And now across the country, you're known for having the niche of Fox Reds in your kennel breeding program. Yeah, now studs. People have bred, uh, yeah, Journey across the country. Uh, You're known, if you want a Fox Red, you go to Mike Vaughn. Right. That's that's where it's came to right now. That's what it's came to. So a lot of people are, and like I said many times, and I'll say it again is, you know, eventually, if you see me put a string out at a tournament or you see me pulling at a hunt test, pretty much all you're going to see in my own personal dogs is me walking on with fox reds. My my last yellows are Ackley, which she's a white one out of Winnie, and I, and I got her bred to Journey right now, and I'm just praying There's that something word. comes out red. But she's completely white and Journey's red. And I think the fox red gets this mix, misconception still. People call me and be like, well, where does this fox red thing come from? Even, I mean, it's almost, you know... 20 years later, 15 or 20 years later, since I saw my first fox red, and people still don't know what a fox red is. Or a red fox. <laughs> a freaking red fox. By the way, that that's right. I heard that at the kennel, and I heard yeah. that when I was pulling through the drive thru. Yeah. I said, is that a red fox lab? Yeah. I'm like, what? A, what? Well, yeah. But, it's, but I didn't know people called them that. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with calling them that. But it just cracked me up because I never heard of a red fox. I always call it because you always said fox red. That's what right. I always heard. But right. people call them red foxes. Right. Wherever that marketing term came from, I actually don't even know where the where the. But it's the a mar- good marketing. Yeah, term where the, is. where that marketing term came from. I mean, maybe some of the older fox red breeders than me know where that term came from. But it basically it was a lab as red as uh, as a fox. <laughs> or maybe, <laughs> to, or maybe it's just, a red fox. I just had to throw that in there. Is it a red fox or or is the fox red? <laughs> Oh, that uh, I was laughing. Yeah. Anyway, so you know, and nor- normally on the marketing, it's a, it's fox red, but I didn't I didn't know what a fox red loves and I f- what it was, and I found it gorgeous, like I was saying with Ackley Braided Journey. So eventually, in Whisper is like a, she's got reddish tint in her yellow coat because she's not a cowboy. So now I'm going to be breeding her to Journey, and I'm going to be able to get some reds out of her. And if Ackley would give me a red, so eventually, you know. Five, six, seven years now, you know, I don't even want to think about this day with those yet. But, you know, when, when I'm at that level, well, you know, I'll have reds that's continued out of them. And then the yellows, the yellow will be out of my out of my breeding program. Now, can two fox reds make a, a yellow? Yeah. And is there anything wrong with them? No. Now I got a problem. The problem I got now is somebody will call me and say, I want a fox red. I'll be like, okay, well, I got a yellow. No, I don't want a yellow. I don't want a yellow. As if the yellow is red. as if the yellow is something delinquent. Well, Winnie's a yellow. I mean, would I take Winnie all over again? Heck yeah. You know, now what I just want personally is the closest thing to Winnie that's Fox Red. Well, the closest thing to Winnie I got right now that's Fox Red is this dog named Reason. Oh, you know, yeah. and she's freaking, and she, like I said, she's got journey puppies right now. Reason, Reason is my modern day Winnie, right? And I would call her your foundation Fox Red female, even going back to Lucy because you didn't raise Lucy. Yeah, I didn't raise Lucy. You bought Lucy. So I'd literally call Lucy is what made your two your Patriot and Reason. But I'd yeah. really call Reason your foundation fox red female. 
That's true because because she's the one that you raised as a puppy to buy her. Yeah, I bought Lucy as a three year old, and she's been a great addition to this kennel because I kind of got Winnie's line and I got Lucy's line. And just throws great puppies. And throws great puppies, and she was fox red, and she started my fox red, and she's a perfect pedigree, and I was really lucky to get her her too. And so she kind of started a fox a pure fox red. You bought her at five or six. When she was five or six about? No, I think she was just four, three just or four. Just three or four? Yeah. And she hadn't had a litter yet. And um, and now she's just throwing amazing puppies. Well, Patriot and Reason are out of her. And she's my foundation. She was my foundation. My my brood matron female yep. is Lucy to start my fox race. Now, Reason is, like you said, my foundation female. And I made that pairing with uh, Susan Bletzel's Valor, which is a qualified all-age male. He's made Medal of Honor. And I made that pairing with a dog, which is so awesome, which I love about genetics, so I'm geeking out again, <laughs> is with a pairing of a male that's been dead. Susan let me get some semen of Valor's, and I bred my Lucy, and he's been dead for I don't know how many years he was. Um, he was a great dog, and I brought that back. So what's awesome about genetics, too, is Cowboy and Journey, I freeze their semen. I try to get them to the clinic once a month to get them collected and froze. Because 15 or 20 years, 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, I see a female that says, man, I wish I could breed her to Journey. Well, I can't. Mm -hmm. That's what's cool about genetics. That's what's awesome. I can have Journey letters 20 years from now. And people are already asking me, well, you know, as Journey gets older, because right now Journey's nine and a half. Well, can you save me a straw? Can you say, well, I'll let you know. Like, that's first stored for me. If I have, if I want to release a few straws for people, I will. So that's why right now I'm, you know, I got Thriller and I got a couple other males I'm going to keep out of uh, Journey this year because I want to get a uh, male out of Journey now that represents Journey in the next level of, of being a stud dog, a Journey of a Journey son because technically a dog will go impotent, impotent somewhere around 10 years old. So I, I'm raising Thriller right now. He's he's in the middle mark of, of what I want. He's only a year old. I like a lot of things about him. I like some, there's some things I don't like about him. So as a breeder, again, like I discussed you with Thriller, I'll be like, it, all right, Thriller, if, you, if there's certain things I don't like, well, I have to make the hard choice of Thriller's got to go. And going off of that, I think this is a perfect time to talk about making the hard choices because you went through three Fox Reds when you were trying to find your first Fox Red stud dog before you got Journey. Right. That you got rid of. Right, and we talked about it last podcast. And that's, that's right. part of creating the journey of creating Wingmasters was those three first Fox Reds. You were figuring out what you liked. You figured out what you didn't like, dabbling here, dabbling there, and then you finally got journey. Yeah, you just said that perfectly because had I kept uh, – um, when Strike One was eight months old and I was getting him through the train retrieve training, uh, I was like, oh, my God, this lazy – miserable fighting you didn't want to do it and i got him force fetch i mean i'm gonna get any dog through the train retriever what you know some people call force fetch some people don't like the name force fetch whatever the trained retrieve whatever you want to call it all right and i think I'm, I'm like this guy this dog's miserable and then i started doing a little bit of power work with him which for you that don't know what power work is if you're listening is you know i start teaching them hand signals which means i start sending them and teaching them how to how to do blind retrieves and waterfall and he just did not want to do it. He had no. He just fought me and everything. Yes, you know what? If it's exactly what we were talking about earlier, am I am I going to end up training this dog or training for the next ten years? Dogs like him, absolutely not. See you later. See you later. I had to solve. You know, my then friend, I led, led to strike two. Then I led to strike two, <laughs> which was trying it again, which we talked about last. Was time. there was no it. strike three no, in there? No. no, no. <laughs> then I went to ninja out of a great breeding. And then I went to, to Journey in, uh, I was like 11, because my, my Fox Red fascination of wanting to look for a male started at 11 and I didn't get Journey until 14. So there was three years of me calling out dogs to get to, and just like on the pointer side right now, there's over two years, well, there's two and a half years of me calling out females to get the Candace. And the worst part about all that is you can't just call them out right away because you need to see force fetch you need to see pile work you need to see marking ability you need yeah. to see upwind ability you can't just say at four months oh, i really don't like him right now bye no you're a year or two in so you can't and it's hard to have five dogs that you're raising right now right. looking at each one you, it's not a lot of people you don't have the time for that right now for f looking at five stud dogs every single day and raising them up to 12 months to look at them it's just not feasible it's not feasible so 
so you need to put the genetics in your favor, which so is that's why, why it took so long. That's, that's why, why it took, it took so, long. so long. You took one a year, right. pretty much, as you trained him. No, this isn't it. Bought another one, trained him for a year, found out it wasn't it again. Right. And you know, the whole time I got Winnie, and so Winnie is a year old, and this will be an important part of kind of leading the journey too, because Journey and Winnie end up being the foundation of my place. So let's just you know stop and, and say that for a minute here is. Winnie was my foundation female that was everything I believed in a dog. And it's like, and I even said this many times, I wish Journey was, or I wish Winnie was a stud dog because then I could really improve this breed by breeding Winnie to all these females around the country. So there wasn't going to be anything that lived with me that was anything less than Winnie, right? So strike one, strike two, and Ninja, you're out. You guys ain't anywhere near what Winnie was. I mean, think about Winnie's trainability. I'd like to know this. And I'm sure, um, is it Retriever? No, no, Retriever Results. I'm sure I could contact Retriever Results. Uh, it's a website that has all these results of hunt tests and they gather all this data. I'd like to know who's the young, what's the youngest dog to ever pass a senior hunt test. The youngest dog to ever pass a senior. I know Master, Cripe, I know there's a couple of Masters that are that were... 12 months or 13 months old. What did Topper Town tell us? Like around 13 months old. Well, I think he just got beat again. He said he just got beat by like a week or two, and now he's going for the 12 or 13 months. Somewhere yeah. Like it's, 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 it's between 12 and 14 months. It's between 12 there. and 14 months that they're actually a master hunter, so which means they have six, six, pass, six passes, passes, right? Okay. So that's a very, very hard thing to do, right? But Winnie... I had I ran her in a senior test at seven months, three weeks old. Now, most of the time at seven months around here, this dog's just getting going. They're just going through foresatch. They're just getting their bird work. They're just they're just growing. At this time, I already got her running doubles, blinds on land and water, honoring another dog, walking to the line with me, doing walk ups, doing diversion birds at seven and a half months old. So I love to know. If anybody's got me beaten, if you do, send me a message. I'd like to know. Or if I if I am leader, that's one prideful thing of it. And I don't care. I mean, it doesn't change anything. It's just a very... So when you're thinking about trainability of Winnie, it was like I was telling you with Karma. Uh, Alex Lord New Dog is... fetched, right? Yeah, now, Alex New Dog's Karma. So I said, don't be afraid to start teaching her how to fetch properly. Like we put that reel up of her being in the clubhouse because it's cold out. And now you got her picking everything up at four yeah, and a half. Yeah, it just shot her a bird. She brought it back to hand. Yeah. To pick up all four. And don't objects. be afraid. Everybody, everybody's got this thing with, and this is truth be told. We're on the truth be told podcast here. Yeah. You know, everybody's afraid to start doing force fetch because you'll ruin their personality. No, no. Force fetch is, I'm over that. I'm sick of that stuff. You work with what they give you. You work that with what young, you give you and you start young. teaching yep. them how to fetch for you. And at a young age, you start teaching them that whatever goes in your mouth Come comes to me. You don't own your mouth. I own your mouth. You are a federal express, or you are a FedEx Express. You're FedEx to whatever bird you get. You FedEx that thing to me and heal, and you bring it right back to me right now. Most expensive FedEx Express I've ever had. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it is FedEx. Oh yeah. You better is. FedEx me whatever bird goes in your mouth. So you teach that already at, at three. You start imprinting that three, four months. A lot of times here, uh, I have dogs are fully. Doing the trained retrieve and fully bringing birds back to hand before they're six months old, and that's what and, and yet the standard in the in America is uh, is oh you can't start them till six months old because that's when they get their adult brain and well let me tell you the further they get along the harder things get because they start to do things on their own terms. So if you take a three four month old puppy, start teaching them to hold a paint roller, start teaching them to grab it, start teaching them to chase it, start teaching them the hear command, the recall command. Pretty soon, all they know is what you taught them because they're so impressionable at that age. I always dreamed of having a dog like Winnie when you'd always tell her, hey, I just put her up on the table and I said, this is interesting. Let's, let's see if she just fetches, hit the collar, put, turn on the air, just nailed it out of my hand. Well, that's right. exactly what happened with me. But chaos, it wasn't like that. I struggled for right. it. But, and it took me. I had him completely force fetched at a little after six, about six and a half months. Well, Karma here, I sure her one thing. It just reminds me so much of her grandsire journey. Where I sure want to think she's fully force fetched at four and a half months old. Right. It's just crazy. It's just that's crazy. That's trainability. It's like trainability. Like, chaos right. had to take a little bit more time to mature. Some right. dogs, you can have an amazing dog that just took that a little, couple extra months to mature. There's nothing wrong with that. No, and also at that time, you didn't know how to do it yet. So at that time, you didn't start chaos at that time either. Exactly. 
You know, and some of it depends on on weather. Like sometimes you're not doing things because of it was a beautiful time year. year. Yeah, it's a beautiful year. year. Like we haven't gotten much snow right now. So you're, I'm like, just get her going. Be, I said she's got. I saw she's got the it factor. I said Karma's got the it factor. And if they got the it factor, start going right away. You know, and you can do that right away with any of them. And that's what she started doing. But so Winnie had that pass at seven and a half mo- at seven and a half months old, uh, ex- uh, seven months three weeks. So that somebody don't come after me on some for you. Oh, you got wrong facts. It's actually seven and three weeks. Yeah, yeah, I know that. You can go to Entry Express and look at it, man. All right. But so so she does that. Well, that's amazing trainability. I knew already that I'm like, wow. She was eight months old out marking all the dogs that were two or three years old that I was training at the time. It's like, are you kidding me? This is wild. I mean, and she built everything. So People would see me with Winnie and how good she was trained and how awesome she was and be like, I want my dog trained by Mike Vaughn because I want my dog to run and be trained like Winnie. What they didn't know is how good genetically she was, how intelligent she was, and how um, how she could kind of read my mind because of the bond her and I had, right? I mean, I trained some phenomenal dogs, but my business was built off of Winnie. And right? looking back now, not a lot of people know this, but what is your biggest regret with Winnie? Yeah. My biggest regret with Winnie is I never bred her to journey. And it's because of me understanding genetics. Yep. I, Winnie was a very dominant female. She very, very much thought that she was it. Like if you asked Winnie, you know, and we can even say this in a podcast because you asked Winnie, there's no bitch better than her. Yep. There's no female dog better than her. She didn't think any male dog was better than her. If you were to ask Winnie, she was so confident and so good and so confident in herself that she could voodoo off of me and like, we're going to win this boss. When I was nervous at the national championships, when I went with her, like, oh, here we go. We're in the finals. She just would look up at me with them brown eyes and be like, I got you. Let's go. You just kill the damn birds. I'll show you where they're at. Right. And so. I got got goosebumps right now. I'm thinking of that. Yeah. It was (laughs) because, I mean, that's just the, the way she was. But, you know, so she took everything on what you know I believed in and where we were going and everything. And it shows everything there. So now on the other aspect of journey, he's also a very dominant male. Right. So, so I'm sorry, yeah, I got no, no, I'm sorry, I was thinking about uh, but I'm <laughs> glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Because I told him about this at the podcast at times and sometimes when we're doing this, five other stories come to my mind when I'm talking about one. So thank you for getting me back in it. Yeah. Journey is very dominant, very confident in himself. And I was like, okay, knowing that they're both out of Stony, I'd be line breeding both these dogs. And if you line breed, the, if you know anything about line breeding, you can study it. You can look it up online. Line breeding is supposed to accentuate uh, uh, characteristics in genetics. Well, what if I make these dogs that are both dominant so accentuated that they become aggressive? Then all of a sudden, I got aggress- aggressive dogs in my in my pedigree. So I was being a responsible breeder knowing that, mm, they're both a little too dominant to be together. There wasn't enough reward for the risk. There wasn't enough reward for risk, but it's my regret. You wish you could have seen it. I wish I could have seen it because you, I would have stopped it. Yeah. I would have made sure that those puppies didn't get bred, and I would have made sure that those puppies didn't go on. And you made sure that they went to the exact homes that you chose. To the exact homes Nobody that could just chose. buy one. Nobody would have been able to just buy one. You know, I would have I would have made sure that they went to the right spots to say. That way I could have kept the grip and saying, okay, I did this. I made a little risky breeding here. I want to make sure they're in the right homes and make sure that they're the right stuff. So that was why. But that's a huge regret of mine. That's like one of the only Winnie regrets besides the uh, – I. Uh, the other regret I got was two weeks before she passed away, she was bouncing up and down, and I was going to shoot birds for our tournament dogs. And I looked at her, and the trailer was full. And I, I could have just doubled up our dogs, and I was like, I want to – I, sh- I said, sh- she's like running around the truck. And I was I, I even was in a loader. I'm like, well, you know what? We're kind of full here, girl. And I was in a hurry and I needed things. And I was like, why did I not just load you and give you your last birds? I didn't. I mean, of course, I didn't know that two weeks later, uh, things were going to take a turn for the worst. But, you know, this is, take that pic- picture that I talk about all the time. Make that, make that memories, uh, have no regrets that you hear me talk about when we're uh when we're uh oof take the time to uh, take yeah. that extra second. yeah I, I didn't i thought i'd be able to make it through with this a little bit but um 
Whew. Okay. Um, yeah. Take your, do your, don't have no regrets. My regrets are simple. I gave her an awesome life. I, if, it, I mean, there's another story we'll talk about, a master uh, trail where I was 33 days on the road with her. And we'll do that in our story. We'll save that for another time. But, so, but to go off of that for right now, that was my regret. And that was my journey. But, so now coming to what we were talking about, journey was all of a sudden when I got him was exactly the same as Winnie and they had the same grandsire. And I'm like, oh, hell yeah. Hit the jackpot. Here we go. And then let's talk about journey's picking process as a puppy. I, now, once again, I had bought Winnie from Kim Feister of Rainmaker Labs. And so I uh, I, I go, all right, I'm going to go back. Well, I just as I'm looking, my buddy texts me. He says, Kim's got another litter. I'm like, well, obviously, shit, that's where I got Winnie from. This is rocking. So I messaged Kim. I'm like, by any chance, do you have a male out of that? There was four males. And the female was a carrier. Again, I'm going through a whole repeat story. EIC of carrier. EIC carrier. I'm going through a whole repeat story of what I'm talking about with Winnie, too. Right? The thing, the God has his way, right? So here we go. And I contact Kim and she goes, well, I'm going to get him tested. I'll let you know. She gets back to me and she goes, and first off, Kim did this really thing for me. She says, I was holding one back for either for myself or for a pro trainer. And she says, I see how well you're doing as a pro trainer. Cause now I'm only three, four years in. And she goes, I think that this would be really good for you as building your career as a pro trainer. So she said, I'm going to allow you to have journey, my pick, which was, I mean, so gracious of what Kim had done for me. She gets back to me. She says, they're, I mean, they're all nice and dark red, just gorgeous puppies. And she said, four, only one clear. I said, oh, we'll send them down. I was, uh, I was on a, um, that was when I was 33 days gone with Winnie in 14 and a master national in the world. And that's a whole nother story. And I had a friend of mine. I said, well, can you go pick it up? And he went and picked up the puppy for me and had journey. So for the first month of journey, he stayed with friends of mine, Dave, My- Dave and Jessica Myrick. And they kept sending me pictures. I'm like, oh my God, I can't wait to see my fox red male. This boy. And then I started gun. Con- then by the time I got home, he was already like three and a half months old. I haven't even got to see him yet. And they're sending me pictures and videos. <laughs> I'm like, oh man, this is going to be it. And as soon as I started training him like Winnie, going through the training process, I was like, oh yeah. I remember I called Tim Samelstead when he was five year- five months old. And I was putting birds out for him. And I got off and I'm like, I got to call Timmy right now. Because him and I were always talking about dogs in our next biggest thing. I called Timmy and I said, Timmy, I said, mark my words. Journey is a champion. Mark my words. I said, I got him. I said, it's finally. After after four years, he's here. I said, this son of a gun is as good as Winnie. He's going to be as good as Winnie. And man, now that story speaks for itself. And it's crazy to think that I'm telling that same story. And Journey is now going to be 10 in July. And now what happened when one's Journey got his HRCH, Master Hunter, Dog of the year at 19, all, all of his titles, but even before that, once once he was two and you started breeding him, what happened after two years of starting to breed it to him? Yeah. Well, I, and that's. And that's uh, kind of how your breeding stud dog program came came about. Yeah. Was Journey uh, breeding so many females? Correct. I have learned so much by watching genetics and watching what people were doing with different dogs in the country. And there was this guy named Chris Smith. He's a good friend of mine too. And we, him and I, he's black ice retrievers and we talk a lot. He's a great guy. And uh, he had this dog named um, Supersonic Scooter, black ice Supersonic Scooter. He was the number one fox red in my time where he was getting bred to the most. And I said to Chris one time, I said, hey, uh, you know, how come you never hadn't made yourself another scooter or how come you didn't get um, another male that wasn't in Scooter's line and, ra- and raise him up and, and, uh, you know, get yourself in our stud to breed all the scooter females that are out there. And he said, I did. I tried. He went through the same thing I went through. He went through four, four dogs on pros trucks, you know, spending thousands of dollars a year and them coming out and being like, you know what? They ain't going to make it. He said, finally, I had to give up on the idea. He said, I was, he said, I was 30, $40,000 in and I couldn't get another one like him. So when you get that special dog, you know, it's a it, like Winnie, who's a building a foundation female. And you get the special dog like Journey. You know, it's like wow, it's a, it's like handed to you, and you got to run with it. So Journey, he's breeding females, and he's doing great, and he's getting a lot of breedings. And now he's at the time Journey was the only 
When he was two years old and 16, he was, at the time, he was the only Fox Red Master Hunter in Wisconsin. So, like, for sure, people are going to start coming to breed to him. Yellows, Fox Reds, Blacks, whatever. You know, that's the thing. I think people need to understand it, too. You know, Journey's a Fox Red, but there's awesome Blacks out of him. You know, Journey Doesn't bred Black that, females. Yeah. You bred, like, it's like now, because I'm a Fox Red guy, that everybody thinks I hate Blacks or I hate Yellows. No, it's totally untrue. I mean, I, Journey's, uh, there's some phenomenal dogs out of out of Journey that are yellows and fox reds. It's just what I'm breeding and what I'm keeping has to be fox reds. You just prefer fox reds. There's yeah. Nothing, there's no difference. There's no difference. It's just color. I, I mean, I'm half owner on Chopper, and he's a dang rock star with Nick Nelson. And, I mean, I love Chopper, and Chopper puppies are rock stars, too. That's what Craig Anderson owns that we started this podcast with out of, it's actually out of Chopper, which is three generations there, too. So, you know... Now, Journey's breeding females, and I knew what Chris had went through, and I'm like, man, could I pull this off? Could I potentially pull this off? You know? And I go, all right, could I pull this off? And I go, all right, here's what, I, here's what we're going to do. I, st- I put my, Dave, my buddy Dave Myrick on. I said, let's start looking for another fox or in the mail. And he, sa- and he says, all right, what do you want? What do you want? I said, get me another one. That same thing. Journey, 65 pounds smaller good pedigree and he finds me this breeding and he says you might want to check this out now here goes the dang story again i call the guy and the females in the icy carrier again so i don't know where this why this story now that we're talking about this I can't believe the story is coming up again so I, I go all right he says i'm gonna have him tested i said here we go the same exact story apparently this story keeps repeating its history of myself and then it turns out great that's what's been happening so hopefully that just keeps, but now we don't have no EIC carriers in our bloodline, so we don't have to have this story much longer. So uh, we weeded that story out. But I go, okay, yep, there's two available. Okay, I said, okay, just send me the, the reddest one. And Journey was, or I mean, not Journey, Cowboy was bred in in uh, North Carolina. In Cowboy's pedigree, he had a dog named Rooster Smasher, which Torg's Labs also owned, which they also own Stony. So here we go with history repeating itself again. And I never knew that actually. You never knew I, that. I never. I always. You always talked about Rooster Smasher, but I never knew that Rooster Smasher was owned by Torg's Labs. Torg's Labs. Linda and Torgensen. Was, and that that's the same as Stony. I never knew that. That's even cooler now that I know that. Yeah, and, and Linda Torgensen is um, uh, sister in laws with a uh, lady lady named Catherine Birch, who's bred a cowboy a bunch of times, and she's in Lower Michigan, and she's a friend of mine as well, and she has the same passion of breeding for me. Um, so, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. So now, here we go again. Now, Torx Labs ended up owning these sires. So, and I said to my brother-in-law, I said to everybody around me, when I got Cowboy, I said, he has the pointing lab behind him, but he's got a, a field champion sire on the top. And if I could get the point, I said, boy, would that be in us? I don't really care. I run flushing uh, dogs anyway. But if I get the point, this would be rocking. And, man, the day that my brother-in-law and I were out, we you got to tell him about the video, how you took the video. Remember that video that you showed me? Of oh, you? Uh, of a shooting at bird? Yeah, when you were recording it yourself. Oh, yeah, we should post that video. Oh, nah, yeah. We, nah, we'll, we'll have to. I got that video, so. If we we'll forget, post. remind us. Okay, forget, put it in the comments and remind yeah. us. I take Cowboy out. Well, first off, my brother and I, to get that story I was going into, my brother and I, Law and I, named Zach Roberts, we go out and we're just putting birds out. And I said, this is my new stud. And, he, and my brother-in-law, Zach, is is gotten into fox race with me too. He finds it. He loves doing it with me. He likes to geek out with it with me too. And I said, this is Cowboy. And Cowboy is like eight months old. He's been flushing. But everything I've been running is Cowboy with my flushing. We take Cowboy out by himself. And it's his first time out by himself at like eight months. When he's four months old, of course, he flushed some birds. He never showed point. He didn't show point much at four months old. But I didn't give him much opportunity either. So then, eight months old, comes out, whoom, he just whacks a point like an English pointer. I said, you got to be kidding me. I look at uh, my brother-in-law, Zach. I said, no way. He says, well, we shoot the bird for him. Tell him to fetch it and flush it and take him to the next one. I put out four birds, I remember. Take him to the next one. Whack, 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 bird four. I said, well, I think I got a pointer from here on. Well, then that story that you're talking about is I had my phone in my hand with my gun. And I put a bird, a, uh, a hen out behind my house. And I put Cowboy on it and it's in this bush. And Cowboy comes and whacks a point on it. And he repoints. I said, oh, there it is. He's got the point again. Yep, this is awesome. And he goes in and I tell him the break point. Goes in and flush it. And, he kind of, and the birds kind of run around. And when he pops it, I hold the camera up. My camera, which is my phone. And I have the gun in one hand. And then I dust the bird. And Cowboy brings it back and everything's perfect. And it's an awesome story. 
That's when you know you're a true wingmaster. You got to hold your, the, hold the camera. So now whenever you see me shoot a bird right now, I'm most likely holding the camera shoot. I got no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Mike's on another level. He just has a camera guy follow him all the time. <laughs> another level. Now I got a paid camera guy. No, I'm kidding. I was telling somebody the other day because we got that awesome girls footage we just posted. And I was telling all people around the phone, I said, well, it's so awesome to have you. Because now that you've learned how to be a bird hunter, now you use the camera like a gun. So if a bird's flying and somebody wasn't a bird hunter, they would just, oh, shoot, I missed a bird. Now you're grabbing, you're capturing the footage we need because it, well, you're swinging the camera like, a, like you'd be swinging the gun. And that's how we're getting all this awesome footage. And that's what you learned this fall with being behind me. And, man, I'll tell you what, i got to give you a big compliment. I got behind you out west, and frick, I don't think my footage is... <laughs> I, like I need that. to become a better I cameraman. I in a little bit. I mean, it's not bad, no, but no. but I mean, because it's, I understand it too. But, but like, actually, that's how I started. I mean, too. at this point now, I shoot so many birds, I'd rather get behind the camera too and film you and show and stuff like that. But, you know, this, the importance of these dogs, of wingmasters, is important because of what we mentioned in the uh, middle of this podcast. We're taking you through the timeline, through the stories of creating where wingmasters has come because you're seeing cowboy online as we're posting you're seeing journey online as we're posting you're seeing mike online as we're posting you're gonna start seeing candace you're seeing patriot and reason all right you're seeing alec with chaos all right now and then you're gonna see karma and it's all about the dogs they write the story i've said this in all my tidbits if you follow my friday tidbits it's all about the dogs i say that all the time hashtag all about the dogs i mean we're taking you, so if you're like, well, I don't know these dogs or whatever. Well, whatever dog's name you hear right now, just think about the story and your, and you, is it being your dog and what the history of your dog is so that you can go. Now, I know for a fact, like Journey and Cowboy are celebrities. You know, to finish off the this episode, because, you know, wow, this got, we got into this fast, didn't we? But we, we covered everything we wanted to cover. That's, yeah, that's, that's the journey of creating Wingmasters right there. Right there. We're covering like, everything. Like talking about the kennel and dog aspect. Yeah. Like we're right now. on the rest. I mean, we're sitting at this table right now because we're remodeling the, the front office and the kennel. And I got carpenters coming in while I'm in Louisiana to, to, to remodel the whole inside kennel and make the dogs more comfortable and um, all climate controlled and everything better for the dogs because we're always doing that like we talked about. But to end this... Um, I think it's important first to say that, and maybe you were going to say it and yeah. didn't mean to interrupt, but we talked about the dogs. We talked about the kennel aspect. We talked about the breeding and genetics. Now, that was the journey of where we are now. Now, right. in the future, as we take you on this journey, we did a lot of a lot of filming this summer, hours yeah. on upon hours, and we found out we're trying to give everybody, when I was behind the camera, when I looked at the footage, we're trying to give everybody the best quality content possible right and we found out that a lot of it we just couldn't use it, like yeah, we I, could it just it mic issues getting better mics getting better cameras get it's just wind right. issues you got to be in the right spot at the right time we want the best possible product for you guys to be able to follow along create your best dog and we want you to enjoy it and make it enjoyable at the end of the day if we were we were working 12 13 hour days and we had to, we saved the phone for the end we were dragging at that right yeah, and, and that's I, not fair to you guys. No, uh, and that's why we brought you along on the journey, journey of it now, because I, you know, I could have kept this a secret for a whole another year, but we're taking you guys with us. And Alec just said it absolutely perfect. We've been talking about this. Uh, it was like, oh my gosh, we got some nice footage for what we need for any type of posting or any type of reels or highlights and everything. But we ran into everything because we were learning about now the camera of what it takes and all this technical, like I said, tech master over here. I told him I got some more. I said, I said, tech master, I got some more things I want to try on. I wanted you to go to the next level. So like he's pushed on it too, but yeah. So I said, let's start over. We need another camera. So we bought the, another new camera and I want to try this lens and I want to try this and we got to make sure it sounds correct. Because when we take you on this journey, Wingmasters, when you when the day is, we get to launch it, say, hey, you get to go on the Wingmasters, purchase the program you want, and follow along with me. I want that day to be like, when you get on, like, holy cripe, the quality, the sound, the teaching, the thoroughness of this program was like, wow, they really did it. So that's why I'm not in a hurry. In all my business I built in the past, I'm in a hurry, hurry up, and then I'm, like, trying to catch up from behind. No, no, we're going to do this right before it's released. 
but we're happy to bring you along on the journey. So we're going to be posting things and showing you things that we're doing along the way. And that's why we were talking about, we mentioned in the last podcast, but we're going to be yeah. posting sections as we go instead of right. posting it all. Because if you want to do a certain, like force fetch, right. when we get force fetch done, all edited, filmed, everything, right. and we're content with it, it's going to go up. Right. And then as we put it up and if we say, hey, there's something that we need to or something people are having problems with, we'll just fill it in and clean it up exactly. even more. And we'll keep improving it along the way. So, yeah, that's why we're we're building that. We're working right now. We have two puppies coming. I don't know. Should we tell them that? Should we tell them this name? Oh, yeah. You got to tell them. All right. Okay. And then I was going to go into another story. But let, let's just let's let's go to this one and then and then let's uh, let's let's bow out here until the next one. All right. I've had this name for a long time. And it's a little bit outside the lines of a name, but I've had Nick Nelson and I have been driving in a truck since 2016. And I said, I know what name I want. I want to name a, a female dog Kinky. And her, her registered name would be the blast under the red covers. <laughs> we call her Kinky. All right. Now you guys can let us know in the comments. If you think Kinky is too far over for like, if a 15-year-old or a 13-year-old is watching our stuff. Because I want to make sure that we keep this PG. We, we, yeah. yeah. We want but feedback. We want feedback. Because we do really want to Right. Kinky. So what what might end up being is Kinky's name or, stage, or might, name. stage name might be Kiss. You know, because we got to keep a PG on the other side of the filming. So you let us know in the comments if you listen to this podcast whether you think Kinky's fine or whether you think that we got to have the stage name of Kiss. And Perfect. and we want it. And it's gonna be fun. This is fun, you guys to say. So and she's born right now. We'll be posting a picture right now. She's three weeks old, um, or she's three or four weeks. We get how her. Dark, she tell, uh, tell her how dark she is. Oh my god, this this pup is so dark. And what does she, she come from? For journey down the red path. What does she come from? Yeah, what's awesome about she comes from journey, and then on the other side, she comes from all the old tournament dogs I admired twenty years ago with the point in it. So now, if I could get her to point. Then I can start my pointing lab line, which is another thing. All right. I always got stuff brewing, right? <laughs> I could start my pointing lab line and now I'd have cowboy bread to kinky or kiss. You're right. <laughs> and, and she's going to be kinky, but we might have to keep a kiss on her. But anyway, and then I can start a pointing lab line and who knows now starting from here on out. Well, now all of a sudden I got a pointing lab line. I got my English pointers. I got my flushers. I like to keep the genetics. I'm, I'm intrigued by it. So that's where I'm working. I'm praying that the mother points hard. And I'm praying that the that now I'd get a pointing lab female out of journey that could be bred a cowboy. And here we go on the pointing lab line now. So stuff is stuff is cooking. But hey guys, we this has been that first episode, we put a lot of work in it and a lot of your guys' feedback and texting us and sending messages. Thank you so much for for your feedback. And thank you so much for uh, the support. And for getting behind us, we just we just started the Wingmasters Facebook page, so you can go and start liking and following the Facebook page, which is going to be our landing page for everything now. Um, and we are on YouTube, so please, uh, for your support, I'm asking you to please go like and subscribe on that. Um, obviously, we're on Instagram, and then Alex got a TikTok going. Wingmasters Wing USA, yep. Wing, Wingmasters USA. So please uh, like and share this stuff on social media. Please feel free anytime. To any video, any post we do to share it anytime. And if you support Wingmasters, please hashtag Wingmasters. You know, to end this, the reason why we started the hashtag Wingmasters, I wasn't going to do it. But this fall, I said, we got to do it. Because when Winnie passed away, I said, I want every single time that I see hashtag wing, Wingmasters that it honors Winnie. And that's what these hashtags, and it's been a hashtag like crazy. So, Thank you so much. Merch I, is coming soon. Merch is coming as well. I We got some comments about when's the merch coming. We got that in the works, and then we want to be able to post that at the right time so we can fulfill the orders. Everything we want to do with this is we're bringing the journey is do it the right way. So thank you guys very thank much. You. Thank you for tuning in. Episode number two complete. We've, we we did it again. Did it. We're, exci we're excited. And uh, hang with us. And everybody have a great weekend. And I know you're going to have to put up with the snow and the cold now, but see you. I'm going to Louisiana. Put on, put on your winter coats. Bye-bye. I'm heading south. Oh, screw you. <laughs>